welcome new students, welcome returning students. Write down this one sentence. Decisions are powerful. Decisions are powerful. And they're really, if you want to be successful in life, from God's perspective, there's really only three major decisions you need to make. Now, he's often called the most beloved professor. So if that person would stand up, please. <laughs> now, by the way, by, by the way, just, just so we're clear, last year I was asked by, <laughs> what I miss? I missed something. Uh, you know what I'm going to say? Yeah. Okay. If you were here, you probably remember that the student body asked if I would share uh, my story with my sweetheart. Debbie Jones, stand up, please. So as I got ready to share the story, I said, good looking, would you stand up? And Dr. Lamper stood up. So just to be clear, the rest of the year, um, when I say good looking, I'm talking about this one down here. Now, Lisa Lamper may say, that's the good looking one. But when I say it, that's the one. All right. So Dr. Rogers, stand up. What are the... What are the three most important decisions that make life, the rest of life, fairly smooth? Who's going to be your master? What's your mission? And who's going to be your mate? You got that? Your master, your mission, and your mate. Now, last night, for some reason, I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, huh. It's, I don't know why numbers come into my mind, but it's been 50 years, five months, in five days today that I've been a follower of Christ. So on Palm Sunday this year was my 50th birthday as a follower of Christ. Decision number one. Decision number two, I remember in 1975, I remember struggling. I went in the woods behind my house and for days, day after day after day, I was chopping down trees. I love to chop down trees that need to be chopped down. <clears throat> and it was in the middle of the woods I finally decided that I felt that God wanted me to be a professional minister versus a ministering professional. When you graduate from here, all of you, Lord willing, will leave as ministers. Some as professional ministers, pastors, youth ministers, worship leaders, missionaries. And some as ministering professionals. In the marketplace is where you will make your impact. So we all leave as ministers. But that, that summer, the end of that summer, I believe, 1975, that God was calling me to be a professional minister. I didn't know what it was. I didn't grow up in church. I knew I didn't want to be a pastor. Lots of people told me I shouldn't be a music minister. <laughs> I just want to see people come to Christ. So that was the second. Third decision, September 1st, 1977, I went on my first date with Good Looking. That was after tremendous use of persuasion abilities <laughs> to convince, first, my roommate that I should date his girlfriend. I have a beach house I want to sell you today. So it was, I felt like God's in this. The hard sell was to convince my roommate's former girlfriend that she should go out with me. But September 1st, 1977 was a powerful decision. January the 1st, 1979, I got to marry her. Decisions are powerful because it sets direction for our lives. And, and this morning, I want to talk about, and, and this morning just sets the context, sets the stage for the rest of what we call the President's Chapels. That means that's when I have the privilege of teaching. And it's just to set the stage. 
It's a powerful question because once I did marry Debbie, the questions don't stop. It's what kind of husband am I going to be? Well, what kind of father am I going to be? What Today, what kind of grandfather am I going to be? When I was called into ministry, I ended up here. That was July the 1st, 1990. And then it was the question was, what kind of professor am I going to be? And as they moved me around, what kind of provost am I going to be? That was a pretty bad one, by the way. Uh, so grateful that Dr. Lamper is now our provost. What kind of president am I going to be? I want to serve you. I don't want to be a president. I want to be one that gives my life to you guys. What kind of president am I going to be? But then when I gave my life to Christ, the question is, what kind of follower of Jesus am I going to be? Now, this morning I want to talk about three different kinds of Christians. Three different kinds of Christians. First is a cultural Christian. And see, I put it in quotes because there's, they're not really a Christian. They think they're Christians because they're not Muslim or Hindu. They think they're Christians. I grew up thinking I was a Christian. But I was as far away from it as I could be. I knew something was missing. So every three months, sometimes every fourth month, I would go to a monastery. This is when I became a teenager. I'd go to a monastery 13 miles from our house outside of Atlanta, and I'd spend the weekend there. They gave me my own room in the barn. I, 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 wanted, I wanted something. I didn't know what it was. I just knew it was something inside that was missing. So I was a cultural Christian. At least I thought I was a Christian. Then the second one is a biblical Christian. That's the real deal. Now, there's a third, and that's a typical Christian. And every single person in here is one of those three. You're either a cultural Christian, a biblical Christian, or a typical Christian. Let's, let's play these out for a second. A cultural Christian has no relationship with God. Zero. They may know about God, but they don't know God. A biblical Christian, they have a relationship with Christ. That They are within the confines of God's love. The Father holds them in His hand. John chapter, I think it's 10, verse 28, 29. He's not, Jesus says, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. There's a relationship, and it will last for all eternity. But it's kind of those commercials late at night. But there's more. There's fellowship. There's a difference in a relationship and fellowship. When I married Debbie Jones, I've been married to her today, 45 years, seven months, and Nine days today. It's our anniversary, kind of. <laughs> but we've not, so there's a relationship. But we haven't always been in fellowship. If I act ugly, something comes between us. And so there's not fellowship. So you can have the relationship without the fellowship. Now there's a difference in being in fellowship and having fellowship. So here's the difference. Last night, Debbie and I were watching an espionage show. I, I like those. They're kind of second to British mysteries. <laughs> and we're just kind of sitting there staring at the television. And I'm going to kill this little bug and send it to, I don't think he's going to go to bug heaven. He's going to go somewhere else. Um, purgatory. So. <laughs> So Debbie and I, we're passionately in love with one another. The, the relationship's wonderful. We're in fellowship, but we're not having fellowship. And the having fellowship is when we turn off the television, turn face to face, and spend that time talking to one another. There we're having fellowship. So you can be in fellowship without having fellowship. So, so what's a typical Christian? Sadly, biblical Christians don't not just have fellowship, but they don't stay in fellowship. 
They let something come between them, and it's called disobedience. That was too big of a word to fit in that little box, so I put sin. Now, so there, and, and by the way, be careful this year. Tuesday was so exciting. You were on fire worshiping the Lord. And, and I was so embarrassed, tears start coming out of my eyes, and I'm trying to make sure nobody sees me. Because you're ministering to me as you minister to the Lord. But be careful. Because it's easy to start sliding. And it usually starts by, I'm just not going to spend time alone with God today. I'm going to skip chapel today. Now, I'm going to hang out with some folks. They seem like they're having a lot of fun. I'm not sure how good it will be for me. But it'll be fun. And I start letting somebody influence me negatively. And, and I found this. You usually can tell where you are when somebody asks you the question, how are you doing spiritually? Often, not all the time, but, but more likely than not, the ones who say, oh, that's great are doing poorly. And the ones who say, you know, I need to be working on this. I, I think God's leading me to do this. I really don't want to, but I think it's the right thing to do. And, and when they say they're not doing well, they're the ones that you're being real close to God. So just watch when people answer that question. How are you doing spiritually? So these three different types of Christians. Now, let's focus on biblical Christians just for a moment. There are different levels of spiritual maturity. Different levels of spiritual maturity. You can be a biblical Christian, be a brand new Christian. Like my neighbor who prayed to receive Christ a year and a half ago, January the 10th last year. Um, he's doing great. But, but he's still fairly immature as a believer. He just led his sister to Christ. But he's still fairly immature as a believer. Now I put up there... 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. And, and these illustrate clearly that there's levels of spiritual maturity. He says, John says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven for you, of you for his sake. So they're, they're these little children spiritually. Then he, he goes, I don't know why he goes all the way to the top. He says, and I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. And then he says, and I'm writing to you young men and women. Um, he, he didn't have a problem. That was just his day, okay? I'm writing to you young men because you're strong. And it's a spiritual strength. Then he kind of repeats and says, I have written to you little children because you know the Father. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. It's a different depth of knowledge. It's... I know Debbie Jones far better today after 45 years of marriage than I did September 1st, 1977 when I said, do you want to go on a bike ride? And she said yes, and my heart just went. <laughs> and it rained that afternoon. And my heart went. <laughs> <laughs> and so being creative, I said, I know the spot on Merritt Island, we were down in Florida, where all these big Floridian birds fly in and fill the trees, and they're preening as they go to roost. And it's just like the, the trees have come alive. I said, would you like to go look at some birds? And she's like, okay. <laughs> and the clouds lifted, and there was a double rainbow, and I went, oh, God, this is awesome. <laughs> he says, uh, and I've written to you, and I'm writing to you, young men, because you're strong, spiritual strong, because the Word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So he kind of maps out immature Christians, biblical Christians, that they just, they haven't really grown in that spiritual strength yet. They haven't really learned to overcome temptation. They really don't know the Word of God like they need to know the Word of God. They're just getting to know God. They, I'm forgiven. All that junk has been forgiven. But then as they grow into young men, they're strong. They know they're forgiven, but there's more. 
They're growing in spiritual strength. They're learning the scripture. They're learning to overcome temptation. In temptation, your generation, you get bombarded all the time. A lot of people are so afraid. What's going to happen to this generation? If you come out on the other end of spiritual maturity, you're going to be a generation that makes a huge impact that's stamped for the glory and honor and praise of Jesus Christ. That's who you're going to be. But you're going to have to make some powerful decisions. You have to make a decision to answer the question, what kind of Christian do you want to be? So, if we're going to be a mature biblical Christian, we need to grow in two areas. These are two separate areas. And if you watch, if you're in your biblical literature, most authors land in one camp or the other. They either write about an intimacy with Christ, how to grow in that intimacy with Christ, or they tend to focus on imitation of Christ. And they focus more on the holiness than they do on that getting to know God in a deep, intimate way. Now, I've just put some different ways of saying this. I'm just putting them together. We need to grow in spiritual maturity in terms of our love for Christ. And, the second area, our likeness of Christ. I want to love Him deeply, and I want to look just like Him. Here's the third way. I want to have deeper fellowship. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful to whom you were called into fellowship with Jesus Christ our Lord. Fellowship is so important. But there's also fruitfulness. I want to manifest love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I want to look just like you. Now, if those are the areas in which we need to grow, how quickly can we grow? Now, I don't want this to be like math class, although Shannon may want me to make it. Where's Miss Nicholson? Okay, you, you may like this, right? Um, all right, so over here, how, how far can we grow in spiritual maturity? Over here, this line, this axis is how long have I been a believer? Now, here's the growth rate that we want to have. We want to be off the charts. We want to be just like a, a, Debbie and I were down at, in Florida at Kate Kennedy. And, and often at night, we, we would go out and watch the rockets go up in the nighttime and all these flames, and it was just absolutely amazing. That's the kind of growth rate we want, but we don't always have that. But sometimes, there's some folks on campus that the way they're growing in their walk with God, it's very inspiring to all of us. It's like, oh, I want to grow like that. Well, why are they growing like that? Because they've made a powerful decision. They want to do that. And some growth rates, it's impressive. But at a certain point, it becomes inadequate. I've been a Christian a long, long time, but I haven't grown very much. And that's inadequate. So I need to ask the question, what am I going to do about it? And here are some ways that we can grow faster and become a mature, spiritually mature, biblical Christian. First way, I get to know God deeper when I spend time communing, communicating. But it's, it's just not, it's not a give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. But it's telling him how wonderful he is and thanking him for what great things he's done for us. And over here, it's conforming to the image of Christ. These are just different ways of saying all this. It's getting closer to God in terms of my intimacy with Him, and it's getting further from sin in terms of my imitation of Him. And lastly, over here, what's important is tog. Who knows what tog is? Time alone with God. Okay, we have to spend time. We could be married 45 years, and if I was never home, 
I wouldn't get to know her intimately. And over here, the important letters are WHS. That's my shorthand for walking in the Holy Spirit. Walking. All right, you've written one thing down. I want you to write the second thing down. This is the summer, summary of the whole year. That doesn't mean you can skip the President's chapels, but it's not enough for you and me to live our lives for Christ. And if you've been here, if you're a returning student, you know what I'm about to say next. It's not enough to live our lives for Christ. We much, must let Christ live His life in us and through us in the power of the Holy Spirit if we're going to live a life of holiness, a life that imitates Christ. Now, there is a shortcut. Oh, let me push the right button. I just saw a laser fly across the room, so... <laughs> Um, technologically astute. Um, if you really want to grow fast spiritually, deep spiritually, suffering, that's the only shortcut I've ever found in Scripture. I choose, if it's up to me, to bypass the shortcut. All right, so what have we learned this year, I mean this session, to set us up for the rest of the year? There are three types of Christians, and, and every person in here is one of these three. You're either a cultural Christian, a biblical Christian, now you may be immature or mature, but, but, but that's the second choice, or a typical Christian. A typical Christian has let something get between them and their relationship with God. And the question is, remember, the question is this morning, what kind of Christian do you want to be? Are you satisfied being there? Or do you want to be all that God's called you to be? Secondly, biblical Christians range in terms of maturity, from immature to mature. Thirdly, spiritual maturity is a function of growth. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Spiritual maturity. And lastly, spiritual growth takes place in two areas, intimacy with Christ, imitation of Christ, at different rates, slower or faster, and through various steps to get closer to God, spend time alone with God, to be more like the image of Christ, Learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. What we're going to focus on this year, it's about once a month I have the privilege of, of being up here to teach. We're going to focus on three things, and I tried to highlight them. We're going to focus on this one, but I don't want you to forget this one, that, to know Him, to know Him intimately. And the He there is Jesus. We want to focus on, let's grow fast. We're not taking shortcuts, but we don't want to lollygag around. We, we want to grow as fast as we possibly can. And then, how do we do that? By learning to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now here at CIU, we call this the victorious Christian life. It's the stone right out front of the chapel. It means this, it's from 2 Corinthians 2.14, it means this, you and I have, if, if we're believers, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit within us. Now, passage has been coming to my mind lately. I've been spending some time just trying to think about it and pray over it. It's Colossians chapter 1, verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. But it says in there, we're striving according to His power, which mightily works within us. That's actually um, verse 29. 
but the indwelling Holy Spirit wants to not just live in us, but manifest His power through us. So we're manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. We're manifesting the image of Christ. We're, we're, we're manifesting victory over sin. So let's go back to kind of our main picture here. Questions are powerful. Which one of these circles is you? Which one of these circles do you want to be you? If you've been here and you've been around some on fire believers and you go, I don't know if I'm really a believer or not, then you can cross over from a cultural Christian to a biblical Christian by asking Christ to come into your heart. Up, down, up, down. Just understand that God loves you more than you've ever been loved in your entire life. But you can't experience that because you disobeyed Him. And you fall short of what He wants you to be. But He's made a remedy for you. And He sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to forgive you for your disobedience. But back down, you have to invite Him to come into your life and take full control. If you're a biblical Christian this morning, what kind of biblical Christian will you be satisfied being? Do you want to stay immature or do you want to grow as fast as you can? Then spend time alone with God. Make it a priority. Have a time set aside each day where you're going to spend time with Him and Him alone. But if you're a typical Christian, then you need to do two things. You need to admit it and say, God, I've not been the believer, the follower of Christ that you want me to be. Would you forgive me? Holy Spirit, would you fill me? Lord Jesus, would you lead me? I want to be all in. I want to be all yours. Questions are powerful. They set the direction of your life. And the direction, not your desire, but the direction determines where you end up. You want to be at the end of your life where there's no regrets? We need to follow Christ fully. Let's pray together. Just with, with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, if you put yourself in that cultural Christian circle, pray a prayer like this. Please, please pray this prayer. God, thank you for loving me and wanting me to spend eternity with you in heaven. Father God, I'm so sorry that I've disobeyed you. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross to forgive me of my disobedience. Lord Jesus, would you come into my life right now? Forgive me of my sin. Give me the free gift of eternal life. And through your Holy Spirit's indwelling power, make me the person you want me to be. If you prayed that prayer, raise your hand very high, please. Just, just wave at me. Nobody's looking. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh my, praise the Lord. I won't, I'm going to hang out up here afterwards if, no, I'm going to give you my phone number afterwards. You write it down. All of you can write it down, but only those that raise their hand can call me, okay? If you put yourself in that typical circle, pray this prayer. Lord God, I don't know much about walking the Holy Spirit. But Holy Spirit, I pray that you fill me right now, that you control me, and that you lead me. I want to be all in. 
If you prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand real high? You won't have to call me. Just raise a hand. Praise God. Praise God. That's exciting. Finally, if you put yourself in the biblical circle, but you want to grow in spiritual maturity this year, you want to make a powerful decision in response to a powerful question. Would you pray this prayer? Father God, I'm going to make spending time alone with you a priority every day of this semester. I want to get to know you deeply. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand? Mm -hmm. oh, bless you. Father God, no question we have the best student body on the face of the earth. Father God, would you speak to each individual's heart? Would you strengthen them spiritually? Would you grow them in maturity? Father, the faculty and staff are here to serve them, to help them become everything they've dreamed of becoming for your glory. And Father, we pray corporately that during our chapels that you would touch us this year, that you would manifest yourself in a way that's powerful, that's real, that is experiential. And Father God, may we know you as a result more intimately and make you known more powerfully. In Jesus' name, amen.